And there were all of these failures that I believe are so important to your development. I think being rejected is one of the best things that can happen to you, being cut from the team, because you are faced with the decision as to how important this goal is for you. Are you like willing to put in the work to get better? This is the Winning in Winnipeg podcast, where I talk to top performing business owners, executives, entrepreneurs, and local Winnipeg celebrities. Today, I have Hannah Pratt, the multifaceted leader of Hannah Rose PR. Some of the words and titles that have been used to describe Hannah are marketer, award-winning communicator, philanthropist, creative collaborator, youth advocate, donor relations advisor, spin instructor, and really that's just, I think, scratching the surface of... uh, some of the trail of successes that Hannah has created over the years. 2019 Future Leaders of Manitoba Award recipient, 2018 Manitoba Communicator of the Year, founder of the Winnipeg Dress Collective, author of the Yes You Can podcast. I'm sure I could keep going. Clearly, you can see that Hannah is incredibly talented, and I'm excited to learn what has helped shape her, how she thinks, and what advice she has for the next batch of entrepreneurs coming up in Winnipeg. Hannah, thanks for being here. I'm so excited. Does everybody else react the same way when their like face starts twitching when somebody else is talking about them? It's, it, it puts you in a little bit of a weird position. I understand yeah. when when uh, I go off on it. It's cool though. It, like that. it is. It's neat. You know what? I actually got quite tired. I needed to take a break when I was kind of diving into all the things that you've done, which is amazing. Like it's, uh, there's a lot to talk about because yeah. you've done a lot and- And really for you, I think you've only scratched the surface uh, of your potential because, well, let's really get into it. So one of the first questions that I have for you is, it seems you're a big advocate for Winnipeg Mm -hmm. and you have been for for a long time. Yeah. Born here? Born here, grew up in the north end of the city. And so I had, I feel, and I'm sure you have a question coming, but I grew up like really, truly in the heart of the North End, which I think surprises some people. Um, I also went, then I went to Kelvin and I had this really unique experience of having grown, grown up on Flora Avenue. You're in real estate. You understand where you. that is, right? Yeah. Until I was 16 and taking the bus to Kelvin to River Heights and having this kind of split experience of this this community that was wonderful, but experiencing a lot of challenges. and mm-hmm. then to a a neighborhood where there's so much opportunity and a lot of my peers couldn't hadn't even been to the north end of the city and i think that sort of shaped a lot of what i do and and the programs that i've inspired to either participate in or found it's because of that of where i grew up and the people that i was surrounded with for a lot of at a lot of my you know yeah, you've been on adulthood. both side of the track. Yeah, quite literally, like on, the Arlington uh, Street Bridge. Everywhere in the tracks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, when when you have to share about Winnipeg, mm. when you're out and about, you're traveling, you're whatever. What is your favorite thing about Winnipeg? This this is a huge. This is a very big question. Favorite restaurants? That's a big one because <laughs> yeah. we're quite big on the gastronomical scale. Yeah. Uh, favorite place to go, things to do, stuff like that. Yeah. What, what do you rave about when you're talking about Winnipeg? Well, you know, what's funny is, um, so for the last few years, I've been diving into this entrepreneurial space after having worked in and for community uh, charitable organizations and nonprofits for most of my career. Now I've been working in online marketing, online courses, and my audience, I have a big spin audience and I provide resources for fitness uh, professionals and instructors. I have a course called Instructor Magic and most of my audience is international. Like I would say 90% of the people who've taken my course are not from here, not even Canadian. Most of them are American or, you know, Netherlands, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia. Like it's very not local. And so when people ask about Winnipeg and that happens a lot, I talk about community first and foremost. And as I was reflecting on that before I arrived here, because I feel like it's one of the most foundational things of who I am and what drives me is, is developing and nurturing community. It, it supports you as an entrepreneur when you know how to build it, when you understand what drives community, um, what excites an audience to feel like they're connected not only with you, but with each other. 
And that's true for also for nonprofits and charities. And so it's just really fascinating to think about how Winnipeg is is like a test market for so many things, mm -hmm. but it's also because we, I think, show up for each other. And I know that anytime I've started a new project, gone to my relationships and my network to ask for something, there is an incredibly passionate community here who are inspired by helping each other out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's the number one thing I talk about, in addition to the fact that, you know, it's affordable to live here and anywhere I go, whether I've yeah, I always tend to talk to Uber drivers <laughs> or like, and I always try to recruit them to come and live in Winnipeg. I'm like the affordability, even with inflation, even if, with all the things we're dealing with um, mm -hmm. currently, the affordability of, of Winnipeg is like none other that I'm aware of where you can also, it's also a big city. It's also, you're not, you know, in a tiny town. Yep. I am a solo a homeowner. I live by myself and I have a, a beautiful house in St. Mattel and I have for eight years and I just don't see that quality of life being possible elsewhere, even though the climate might be, you know, nicer and more enjoyable. Yeah. It's, I saw a, an article come out recently and I, I don't know if it was a financial advisor, but they were talking to young people in Toronto and Vancouver. And they said, if you want like for your future to protect your future, like get out of these markets and go somewhere else so that you can actually afford to retire and have a, a, a more abundant life day to day instead of ex overextending yourself to right. live somewhere small. And so what, what's, what I value is having the capacity to give, to give back and to not feel this immense pressure. Um, and so that's one of the things I love about what I think. And then also that because it's affordable, artists can thrive here. Entrepreneurs can thrive here. You can afford to build a business, open a business, mm -hmm. and you have a community behind you who is supporting you and cheering you on most of the time. Um, so I know that for restaurants, I mean, there's so many, and I'm truthfully just getting back into going out after feeling kind of, you know, for the last few years, like a little bit isolated, but um, I'm going to Adoko after this, which is a beautiful sushi restaurant in the neighborhood. I mean, and there's so many that I I haven't been back to. I grew up in, or you know, grew up in the North End, but then I moved to the Exchange and lived in, on Princess, and love all of those places. And there's, I'm always sort of applaud when restaurants survive beyond you know the five year mark. <laughs> well, especially survive the last two years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We and lost, we lost a lot of good men out there. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. A lot of good menus out there. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> nailed it. Um, on a daily. Mm -hmm. where do you focus the bulk of your time? It's funny is it's like my day to day is it's currently on my business. And so I, in the last year I moved from being full-time uh, director of development and communications at dash foundation. Okay. And in 2020, I got my master's of philanthropy and nonprofit leadership. Previous to that, I have two other degrees in communications and had worked for the Blue Bombers as the director of community relations and a variety of other, they're actually a nonprofit organization. A lot of people don't know that. Um, a lot of other charities and nonprofit organizations in communications and, and marketing mm. and fundraising. And just this year, I moved to Wheelhouse where I am a motivator, a case spin instructor. I have been for four years and I oversee their marketing, which is for two studios plus Wheelhouse Live. And we have subscribers from around the world. And that digital product helped sustain us during the pandemic when every other fitness studio had to shut their doors and yep. completely eliminate revenue. And I've always been into sales. I've always been into fundraising. I think to be a fundraiser, you really have to be passionate about closing a deal and seeing that come together. Yep. And something just hit me where I was like, I, I, I want to, I value freedom and I want to explore this business that's always been on the side of my desk doing marketing, copywriting, strategic consulting, you know, having passion projects. But I want to see this through a little bit more and through Wheelhouse where, you know, I get to teach now during the day. I taught a spin class this morning. I'm teaching seven this week and getting paid to work out is really fun, I have to say. <laughs> and then doing the social media and email marketing building my own business with instructor magic. And that happened through the pandemic too. So day to day, I am at my desk or with a laptop or with my phone somewhere earlier, just before this, I edited a reel and posted it to Wheelhouse Cycle Club's Instagram account. But prior to that, I was working on an email marketing campaign for a launch I have coming up tomorrow. I'm doing 
a VIP copywriting day for a client where they hire me for the entire day and I just focus on writing their website for them and then that's it. And Mm so day to day, it's very different, but something to do with marketing, strategy, consulting and launch launching is, is what I do. Right. I get like, every time you talk, I get like 4,000 other questions. So (laughs) great. When did, when did communications become a big, uh, focus of yours? Was that something like, did it, were you in debate coming up? Did you, did you (laughs) notice that you were good at arguing when you were young or just that you could get your point across? When did it become a a point of focus for you? You know, I think it's, that's a good question. And I haven't been asked it before. I wasn't somebody who knew what I wanted to do. And this might come as a surprise now, but I was, uh, I was not super confident in high school. I was, um, you know, the tall, awkward, gangly athlete, you know, I was like confident on the court, but not really necessarily outside of it. And so finding my voice and feeling confident and and speaking and public speaking was never something that I was, I've, I felt like was my, you know, purpose and somewhere in university, I, I think I was taking a journalism class and it just clicked for me that I loved storytelling mm. and I was, I, I loved reading as a kid. I loved books. I love writing. And I was like, I could tell stories. I can interview people and write stories about that. And maybe at some point, if I get confident enough, I can be on camera. And through that, I heard about the creative communications program and I was like, well, shoot, I would have just done that from the beginning, but here I am getting <laughs> another degree. Yep. Did that, um, got into Crecom, fell in love with learning how to be incredibly intentional with your words. And, you know, that is a an incredibly challenging program. Anybody who knows Crecom, it's like the Crecom Mafia, we call ourselves. And they would send you out on the street and say, go get a story, come back with it, edited in 45 minutes. And if you handed it on time, on the 45 minute mark, you would fail. And they're like, this is how it is in the newsroom. Just figure it out. <laughs> and it was such a shock to the system. Yeah. But I also loved it being very competitive in nature my entire life. And so that that was a bit of a, uh, I guess I felt a spark or an interest in that and telling stories, finding what the story is in a message or in what tr- someone is trying to tell you and then framing that for um, for the news was something I was super interested in. And so I worked in PR. My first job was with the Humane Society. And I was like, I can talk about puppies and dogs and and help get them adopted and using my skills. I'm done. This is exactly what I want to do. So I was lucky to find out what I wanted to do in high school and and learn my ability for communications and be like, you know what? I knew I never needed to learn math. I knew I never needed to do statistics or pre-cal or whatever. Um, and so creativity and communications has always been something I've been interested in and then figured it out pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. I think it was uh, <clears throat> David Goggins' book where he goes into Soul Cycle. Mm-hmm, yeah. And so I read his book a while ago. He he convinced Can't me. Can't hurt me? He, yeah. Yeah. He convinced me to run like an untrained marathon, which was really smart. And then... Um, I remember seeing one of your reels. Okay. And I was was like, holy Moses, as far as the ability to one, work out Mm -hmm. uh, and still have your breath and still control the room and still motivate and still like touch people at a a deeper level, Mm -hmm. which then reminded me of his, of how he, what what he was describing of soul cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, So you said that four, you've, you've been involved in the cycle for four years and then you just moved over? Yeah. So I was, when did I start teaching? 2017 at a different studio. Okay. Very different. And I think, and I tell the story a lot in my classes now, actually. The first time I auditioned to be a spin instructor was 2008. And then again in 2010. And then again in 2012. And then again in 2016. Really? And there were all of these failures that I believe are so important to your development. I think being rejected is one of the best things that can happen to you, being cut from the team, because you are faced with a decision as to how important this goal is for you. Are you like willing to put in the work to get better? And things physically came easy to me sometimes. Basketball was easy. You just stand there and get the rebound, whatever. Yep. Volleyball, I was cut from the team in grade nine, grade eight, grade eight. And it pissed me off. Like it's where pissed me off. And 
I went to every volleyball camp that summer and was captain in grade nine. And I was like, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have been that excited about it. And there's something about spin. I always love the workout. I even in the, you know, good life gym where there's no, like, it's all bright. You, it's really not like a spin boutique spin experience. I still loved it. And I, when I finally got to where I was going to be teaching, it wasn't what I dreamed of in terms of the soul cycle experience with the candles and the music and, you know, bringing my DJ background to playlists. It was more metric focused and there's TVs that people would be staring at as they were working out. And I, I like, like how you just, you kind of just like put that in my DJ background. Like there's, <laughs> there's all these little things yeah. that you just keep putting in there. Yeah. I forget sometimes. And I, I would get, I would like, get frustrated that people were so into the workout where they just wanted to win that they weren't able to go into that deeper mode that you were talking about earlier, Mm -hmm. where you really feel something more. And I think that after teaching there and really cutting my teeth and like doing the the awful 6am rides three times a week and wondering why I was doing this and feeling super anxious. And I was like, this doesn't, I know that I can be better at this, but this sucks right now. And once I figured out what worked and I stopped trying so hard to have the most unique music and felt so much pressure about being perfect and it was just more myself and yep. it was more self-deprecating and funny and like playing the music that you and I probably listen to in our early adulthood, like yeah, by Usher and the Ying Yang twins and all that sort of stuff. Once I started just playing stuff that was fun and then brought in motivational messages from my communications background, yep. everything just clicked. And I became the, I guess, head motivator. I, I now train other instructors at Wheelhouse. And I felt such a passion for doing that, that I created a course on exactly how to get your classes waitlisted for, that's my online course, Instructor Magic. So we talk about marketing, motivation, musicality, how to create a playlist that's effective, um, voice and presence. So when you walk into a room, you can actually gra- you know have those 35 people listening and hanging on to every single one of your words and you feel confident in delivering that message. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me that it was when you actually were able to drop everything else and kind of be Hannah, Mm -hmm. right? Like you found, you found yourself, you were able to to bring that in. Um, What was the first job you ever had? The first job I ever had was being a hostess at Kelsey's Polo Park. Um, and I feel like I was pretty lucky. I don't know. What was your first job? Uh, my first official job mm. was <laughs> Superstore Photo, Video Photo. Oh, right. S- remember they ha- used yes, to have Yes, the those. kiosk. Like the, that like, was it. That's so funny. That was such a... That was a busy, like, hot spot in the, it was. In the Superstore. It was the cool place in the Superstore. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. More than like the meat counter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had, I was lucky to be a hostess. You could wear whatever you wanted. Um, and I had friends who worked at Subway or Dairy Queen and I got to sort of dress up. And then I worked later on at Earl's as a server. And, but after that, yeah, Kelsey's and then I, you know, home run sports and good life at one point, the why I was a day camp counselor. Now that is a challenging thing. You, cats. You're a parent. Oh my yeah. gosh. I was like, these kids are excellent little negotiators. And how are they running the, the show? They're like Donald Trump. Yeah. I mean, and they they are also hilarious. I didn't realize how funny kids were until I had that experience. Um, but yeah, Kelsey's a lot of multitasking, a lot of customer service, a lot of being able to anticipate things. Like you, I think you learn so much working in the restaurant industry that people don't consider to be hard skills that actually benefit you incredibly oh, yeah. later on in life. Oh, all of our kids are going to work at <laughs> least one job in a restaurant. Yeah. Um, you had a lot of jobs and then you got to a point where what shifted? What shifted as far as like, did you not want to work for anybody else did you decide like hey i can do this by myself this is easier or Mm -hmm. was it just a matter of like this is what i want to do i'm going to do it i think that it was it was i had always been doing freelance communications work kind of on the side um when i was able to when it made you know there wasn't a conflict 
And I, I really enjoyed that. And it was funny because I had somebody in Creecom, I remember this moment and she's like, well, oh yeah, you're, you're like a corporate girl. You're not an entrepreneur. And I think that I, I internalized that, which is hilarious because I've always been an entrepreneur. Like I think about the things I would do when I, when I first started babysitting, I made myself business cards and got them printed at like staples or whatever. Do you still have one? No, these were on the, these were like so long ago. Like I'm going to age myself, but I had to buy that cardstock and, you know, design it in word. I've always been a, somebody who finds such, um, just, I, I love building something creatively. And so whether it's been through philanthropic projects, like the dress collective, like that's an entrepreneurial endeavor and I'm creating partnerships and relationships. And so when I decided to do instructor magic and it was during the pandemic, I, and I had extra time and I wasn't teaching. I was like, what if this fails? This would be really embarrassing if this did not go well. And I had no idea how it was going to go. I took a course to learn how to launch online, created an email list, built my audience, built a community, which I knew how to do and just crossed my fingers and had a plan. You know, I did webinars. I, I learned I step by step by step. And I had to close doors early because I because I had so many people and I had offered a one-on-one -on -one bonus and I will never do that again <laughs> of time for time. money. Yep. Right. And from then on, it was like, I had this incredible passion for teaching spin for mentoring others. And then I actually had people come to me and ask how I launched that course. Would you teach me? Would you coach me? And now I have a coaching program for people who want to do scale their one-to-one -one services into online offers. Beautiful. And that was like, I realized I was only limited by the amount of time I could invest rather than my potential. And realizing that truly being like, I'm limiting myself by, by spreading myself thin. And it's not that I can't do it, but it's the more I go deep with this, the better it will be for me. And unlike trading time for money, I can take on another person into one of my courses and that will increase my revenue. And mm -hmm. I think once I had a taste of what it was like to be responsible for my own salary and, and have clients that I was serving, but able to really scale it. Um, I just became incredibly passionate about trying to show others how to do that and feel passionate that people should, should be able to wor not work every single moment of their day and trade time for money and instead leverage their intellectual property and teach others. If you're the best, you should be teaching others how to do something um, versus just doing that thing. Right. Was, was that, did that ever become a, a, an issue for you as far as focus and the amount of things you had going on? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm a person who says yes to things and that is wonderful for, for taking messy action and just like, learning how to do something. Mm -hmm. I had to think it was maybe Richard Branson who said, say yes and figure out how to do it later. That quote could probably be attributed to a million different people, but um, I always believed in that. And, you know, do things scared is another thing I tell my, my writers to do a lot. But I realized when I was 34, so I guess last year that I have ADHD and it was like the most hilariously accurate thing that I, once I realized what ADHD actually was, which is usually an overabundance of attention, not a lack of it, um, and creative brilliance and uh, dopamine dysregulation. So you find ways to motivate yourself, which is like procrastination sometimes, or doing the next exciting thing, shiny object syndrome, that sort of stuff starting things really well, not finishing them. I was like, oh my God, this is literally like describing me to a T being really yeah. great in crisis. Um, it, it was just every single attribute. And one of those is, yeah, having way too many things on the go. And because I have really high energy for and capacity for doing a lot of different things at once and I can multitask really well, but that can also like that that can also, that, that opportunity can be also be a challenge. So I just have to learn how to harness it. And I definitely know that now. Yeah. A little more nose now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What was the first big project that you, you took on that scared you that was either a community project business, uh, something that you dove into? Yeah, I think, 
I, I honestly think that the Humane Society was one of those jobs where I am the my former boss is a mentor of mine and she's tough and she, she's a person who's amazing and brilliant, um, but is like, OK, go figure it out. Like, I think I did a CTV interview my second week there and immediately became a public spokesperson for the organization and fresh yeah. out of communication school. That is terrifying yeah. to be doing CTV morning live, especially when you're wrangling like an animal, <laughs> like that's a whole different thing. Yep. And I remember just being a little bit shaky and practicing everything I was going to say in that car on the way to, I think then I had breakfast television every single Thursday morning. We had a regular spot. Unbelievable. And I just, again, it's just, you figure it out. And the more exposure you have to, to trying and failing or trying and stumbling, and then being able to edit your words and slow things down. Mm -hmm. um, that was huge for me. So much experience. And that was terrifying. Um, the responsibility of that at a younger age in my 20s. And I think a lot of people don't get thrown into enough situations to really figure out how strong and how capable they are. So that was one thing. And then a lot of stuff with the bombers, for sure. Um, it was a really cool job of being able to direct the halftime shows and be in charge of a lot of things. I also did not know football that well when I <laughs> started with the team. That's a good place to start. <laughs> yeah. And I remember Wade um, recruited me for that role. And in our interview, which was like three hours long, um, he's like, I don't care if you know football. I care if you are excellent at what you do and are willing to work. Yep. And we just jived immediately from that moment. That's great. Um, but yeah, a lot, a, a lot of amazing projects. I was able to be a part of, but all terrifying because there's no, there's no roadmap for half the stuff we were doing. That's right. It's like, can we put the mascots on the roof and repel them down? I don't know. Like, what's a finger? Maybe. Insurance? <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, uh, somebody else should be figuring this out, but here I am. So yeah, it, <laughs> we did it. We did it. There's, it went, okay. there's many times where I think somebody else should be figuring this yes, out. Like, there yeah. should be a professional doing this. And for the record, um, it made it onto TSN's top 10 mascot fails. We were number four um, because the That's Buzz amazing. and Boomer, was it Buzz? I think, I don't know which one. We had Green Drop Repel Down first, okay. and it was this military appreciation game. And we're doing this like Mission Impossible. We had uh, the theme song, it's the most ridiculous thing ever. The theme song in the stadium. And then so Buzz and Boomer started chasing. Uh, green drop and we had these arborists they're the only ones who can go up at that level at that height and one of them got stuck like the repelling equipment got stuck <laughs> this is right before kickoff sarah lesky who's a friend of mine was standing beside me she's like is this supposed to be happening i was like no absolutely not and then his like suit started coming apart and i was like just repel the whole thing down repel the whole thing down Anyway, we were almost going to delay the game. And finally, they got him down. And then he, like, played it off. But it was also right in front of all of these children. I was like, this is my worst nightmare. And exactly why I said I didn't want to do this stupid thing. But Amazing. Anyway, yeah, scary projects. <laughs> when, when did you realize uh, the power of marketing and branding and a community like business is really only three <clears throat> things finding finding leads closing leads and filling your promises right yeah so on, on the on the front end of that marketing and, and branding and sales um when was that something that you really realized was was important you know, I don't think I had a full appreciation for it when I was first exposed to one of the most like formative jobs in my life, which was working at Good Life and being a sales membership, uh, membership salesperson. Right. And part of my job was literally finding new leads. And it was broken down to such specific metrics that we had 25 new leads per day, 10 appointments booked, five tours. And then each day we had a metric that we had to hit in terms of sales. Mm -hmm. And it w I was as somebody who doesn't enjoy or at the time I didn't enjoy that level of um, regimen. It was felt a little stifling. And now <laughs> I appreciate data so much because it is it does. The numbers don't lie. Yep. And when I look at email open rates, when I look at the subject lines that were on those emails, when I look at how a caption was formatted or when the beat drop happens in a video on that reel and 
we look at the views and the conversions. And when I look at a webinar and when I said something and invited somebody to, to join the program, it all like there's a story that's within those numbers. And so I have become the most data driven metrics, you know, what is it? It's like metric based decision maker ever because it takes the drama out of it. It takes the uh, am I a bad person or was this a bad decision? Like it's it's all about those numbers. And if yeah. you can feed the funnel with those leads that you were talking about and then make those people see what your what transformation is possible for them based on the service you provide. So whether it's a spin class, what are you going to get out of the spin class? Well, it's not necessarily just a 45 minute sweat. It's what are you going to feel? How are you going to be proud of yourself? What is going to happen as a result of those 45 minutes? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think too many people talk about the process instead of the transformation. They talk about what's included because they're nervous about actually standing on a promise, a program promise or a product promise of what that thing is going to do for them. Mm -hmm. So I, from a sales perspective, that was super important. And then I, people say things like, you know, marketing is what brings somebody in and branding is what keeps them there. And I would also argue that community connection, um, a personal interest and affiliation to you, especially if you have a personal brand is what will deepen that relationship and make that customer client person come back time and time again. Mm -hmm. Do you see your, so you're, you're really entrenched in, in wheelhouse and, and the, the spin, uh, your skills can really just go to any market, mm -hmm. right? Is there anything that you have in the forefront? Do you want to move into other sectors? Mm -hmm. Is it, do you just like fitness so much that like, is that, is that something that you want to stick in? You know, it's like, I will always love teaching spin. Um, there's something that for my own self, like I, I feel very fortunate to have an amazing community. I have core riders who will come to every single one of my rides. I see them more than I see my boyfriends half the time, like, or my friends, because they are, they're at my nine 30. And then if I teach again at five 30, they come back for that ride. Like they are so passionate and I just feel honored and privileged that they, that they find something in that room with me mm -hmm. that they will change their schedule. Um, and so I'll always be somebody who loves leading people through that experience. And especially with the DJing background and like enjoying playlisting, I find super, find it really fulfilling just to be creative in that way yep. from, a, from a marketing skills. Like now I have this really cool experience of my approaching coaching programs called total launch formula. Okay. And so I teach email marketing, course creation, course launching, and then public relations and media, um, how to pitch yourself to podcasts, how to pitch yourself to, for a morning show or a magazine. And so it's the entire curriculum of what you would need to create a scaled offer. And I have a group of 12 people at any given time. A lot of people from Winnipeg, actually, interestingly, unlike Instructor Magic, which is all elsewhere, this is a lot of local people. Yep. And I am so passionate about helping other people experience what I have with Instructor Magic and my courses. And taking my years of marketing and communications experience to say, you have this thing that you know how to do really well. Like, why don't you add that as a passive revenue stream to your business? Mm -hmm. Like, you know how to create investment properties, teach other people how to do it. Like it's, and I, I can be a little bit bullish about it. <laughs> like anytime I get my hair done or eyelashes done or whatever, I'm, I'm talking to that person about how they should do a course or, or a workshop or something. So I'm like, you can only be doing this thing for so many hours in a day. And if you want to find more freedom, then I, I believe you should look at expanding and diversifying your revenue. And so that's where I'm, I'm most interested in now is really coaching people. I also have one-on-one -on -one clients who, who are like, your program's great. I won't show up for those calls. I need you to be there with me. And one of my most successful clients uh, is a law school bar exam coach. Okay. It's super niche, yeah. the nichiest of niches. And she was doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with students who wanted to write the bar exam in Ontario and was completely waitlisted. She's like, I, I'm not making the money I want and I'm busy and I'm a lawyer. I want to do a course. And so we worked together to create bar exam bootcamp and she's exceeded like a salary I had recently in her one year 
two launches of doing this and has been able to pay down her law school debt and find more freedom. And she's messaged me regularly being like, this is only possible because I, I did this thing Mm -hmm. instead of accepting that this was how business is that you are exhausted and you hate your schedule at the end of the day. And I'm sure as an entrepreneur, you'd understand that like it can be the best thing and it can be the worst, most hardest thing. Oh yeah. It's crazy how, how, how making money has changed since we were Mm -hmm. kids really. Right. When when we were young and you're thinking like, Oh, how am I going to make a million dollars when I'm young and, and looking what's out there versus today on the, this, the, the many avenues that we can, create and that's mm-hmm. one of them is is leveraging your acumen to get paid and and yeah. leveraging the power of the internet and and our communication reach mm-hmm. across the world yeah. um you're someone that's that's been through traditional education mm-hmm. quite a bit i might add and but also you've taken courses mm-hmm. uh that are very niche to what you want to learn um, I'm, I, I don't know about coaching, maybe uh, hired coaches, I'm guessing. Yeah. Non-negotiable. So those are, those are two <clears throat> very different avenues of education. Mm-hmm. There's, there's only like six specific things that you really have to go to school for mm-hmm. as far as like lawyer, doctor, yeah, you know, professional, stuff like professional. Yeah. So now coming up, it seems like you know, the era of niche education and, and taking all these small courses to build up your skill set um, seems to be something that, especially in the entrepreneurial uh, realm, is like, I need to learn marketing. I need to learn bookkeeping. Mm-hmm. I need to, you know, all these small things yeah. that you keep adding to yourself. Whereas there could be, or there probably is, certain either entrepreneurial courses or um, you know, uh, stuff in business school that, that does teach you a bulk of it. Yeah. How do you look at that as a product of kind of both of those? Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I feel like a few years ago, I probably would have been really passionately on the side of go to school, go to a program. And I remember being a little even offended by some like LinkedIn posters who would say, you don't need to go to Fuck you, Gary yeah. <laughs> yeah. you don't know me. <laughs> I always love Gary Vee. So more, f- I feel like more younger people who were local and be like, you don't need to go to school. And I'm like, well, let's talk about privilege. Like, right. Like if you have a certain amount of privilege and that's, I would include, um, opportunity network, like family resources, that's right, yeah. then it's going to be less important that you go to school yep. because you're not going to need the same amount of credibility that somebody else might need. Yep. Especially, you know, I'm not a person of color. I'm a white, blonde, blue eyed girl. And so I have always been given the benefit of the doubt. And I saw that growing up in the North end, you know, coming back to the beginning of this conversation where, uh, you know, I wasn't accused of stealing when I go to seven 11s and other people would be. Yep. And so School, I understand, gives certain people credibility um, when you have a a well-recognized degree from a well-recognized institution. That sort of gets you in the door. And then I think your lived experience or the things you do on top of that will stay there or help you rise really quickly if you are in a corporate landscape. But doing other things, I mean, we're we're talking about like results you get. And that really doesn't depend on your resume. I, when I invest in coaches, when I invest in courses, I tend to look at that person and say, do they know more than me? (laughs) How do they have results that I want to achieve? Are they, have they confidently done it with other people, not just for themselves? Have they taught other people how to do it? That will sway my decision whether I'm going to invest. And I've invested a lot of money into courses and coaching programs. And some have been great. Some have been like, oh, that was a lot of their sales tactics were amazing because that sort of bamboozled me a little bit. Um, but I think that people can piece together these courses and really, like I talked earlier about the importance of just doing the thing. Like if you can gain experience doing the thing, and I know you're on the last, uh, podcast that's out at this current time was with Alex, who was talked about, he just went to these car dealerships at the age of 15 and started doing the thing. And he went to school for a year and like now he's his own company. So I, really appreciated my formal education, especially Cricom. 
And I always love learning. And so whether that's through a course or a master's degree or whatever, I, I'll probably consistently do that. But for advice for other people, it's like, know that if you don't get the certification that's well recognized in your industry, you might have to prove yourself a little bit more mm-hmm. up front. But really what's going to propel you forward and give you momentum isn't isn't the degree on the door or, or you know, on your wall. And people like, you know, I talked about Wade, who's been a mentor of mine too. You know, he's a, he's a a hustler, a grinder, or somebody who's doesn't have that fancy degree and he has multiple businesses and is super successful. And I think any entrepreneur would tell you the exact same thing. Yep. Yep. Uh, you mentioned privilege. Now you are a female, Mm -hmm. uh, coming (laughs) up in multiple different sectors and stuff like that. Um, do you find like have you noticed much as far as like gender inequality, gender gap, uh, how you're treated versus men? Uh, is that something that you think plagues a lot of the entrepreneurial world and the results based world, or is that more corporate, or is that something you've experienced, not experienced? Mm. Is it something that on the other side, do you feel like you've you have an advantage as a female? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it it depends on on the situation, but I've been in a lot of male dominated industries. DJing was, you know, the blue fun. bombers. <laughs> yeah, the blue bombers, yeah. absolutely. Um, those are two major experiences where I was the uh, the minority in terms of numbers, right? And mm-hmm. and I think it depends on. It depends on how you use it. So for the for DJing, it was way harder to break into it because nobody wanted to help me. And so I was self-taught and I just I looked on YouTube, I rented the equipment and I just figured it out. And then once I was there, having a woman DJ was a complete like it was completely unique. And so mm-hmm. I was getting jobs based on that. My and- wife was a DJ. You know <laughs> really? Yeah. No, I didn't yeah, know back that. Back in the day. That, okay, well, we should jam together sometime. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'd get jobs based on that. Um, clubs would hire me based on that. And then I happened to be good at it, I think. And that matters. So, yeah, yeah, right. And so, especially for legitimacy and again, like proving myself. I had, I had DJs, I like, I would go to Regina sometimes. They'd fly me out to Regina, big deal. <laughs> and, and I remember the opener was really, really surly with me. And he was a, a dude and he was just not giving me sort of the benefit of the doubt or yeah. thinking that I actually had skill behind it. Yeah. And he apologized to me later that night when I had an entirely full dance floor and it was great. And he's yeah. like, I'm sorry for how I acted with the bombers. I mean, I had to learn how to command a space when I had 45 to 70, if it was training camp players who were extremely masculine and tell them what to do and where to go. And Mm -hmm. you have to, you just spoke about hurting cats earlier with kids. Like (laughs) it's like very similar and or or drunk midgets as we know. (laughs) Yeah. And I had to prove myself, um, in a different way while in, in this more aggressive, I would say space, but I also created a cool program there called break the silence and violence against women. And I developed a partnership with the federal government, with the provincial government, brought in incredible amounts of grants and made it a requirement that the team go through um, consent training and sexual assault training. We had speakers flown in who were TED Talks level speakers go in training camp. And Coach O'Shea is one of the best humans in the entire world. And he was completely on side this. And I was the only woman in the room in the very back row with all of these men in their, their players theater as they were learning about this stuff that challenged a lot of their worldviews, especially mm-hmm. around what does violence mean? Um, the spectrum of how we approach women, how we speak to them, catcalling, all this sort of stuff. Right. And then from there, we would take certain players and have them go to, and be spokespeople for the program and go be on in advertisements and speak to high school students about consent and sexual assault and would do like more deep training with them. Yeah, yeah. And so I wouldn't have been able to create that program and create that ripple effect of impact had I not seen it as an, as an advantage that I had this unique perspective and I wanted to use football as a platform for good. Um, and so I have been, I think at, at, at first maybe not given as much credit 
Um, and especially I'm a bubbly personality and, you know, I feel like people just make assumptions about people all the other, all the time. Yep. And so backing that up with having an extreme amount of knowledge and experience is the best thing you can do to sort of prove somebody wrong. Young girls coming up mm -hmm. in, into it. What's your, what's your advice to them? I would say just like, there's a, there's a saying, it's like, be so good that nobody can argue with you or something like that. And I also, I'm listening to the David's, David Goggins book right now on audio and it's, it's hilarious because his Don't voice. Don't run an untrained marathon. <laughs> I won't It's not that. a good idea. I can vouch for that. I will not. Um, his voice is very intense. And so I hadn't listened to the, the preview before I downloaded it. Um, but I, I think for me, um, I mean, we we're in a time where I, I hope everybody is sort of identifying as a, as a feminist. I was talking to my boyfriend recently and I was like, you know, feminist just means that you believe in equality for all. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. that you are um, the most passionate person ever about these issues. It's yeah. just like you believe that your daughters and your wife and, you know, all these people should have uh, equal treatment and equal opportunity and things like there's one in three women in Canada are sexually assaulted. And that means like there's a variety of different things, but I feel like for women and girls, um, really number one, believing in your potential more than what somebody has told you that you can do. Okay. Like Hannah's not an entrepreneur. Well, that we know that's BS. <laughs> like, and so not listening to what somebody else has told you is your limit yeah. and really challenging that, um, trying things that scare you and, being committed to doing it anyway, like look fear in the face and just do it because you never know what the outcome is going to be. And if you spend so much time that you in the, like, I'm going to be bad at this. Well, and if you don't do it, then that's true, but you could prove yourself wrong and you have to just ask yourself the question. What if this is better than I ever expected? What if it turns out to be amazing? What if I learned something new about myself? Um, so I think that from a, from a women perspective, but that could apply to every single person, yep. uh, stretching yourself and being willing to fail is incredibly important, I think, for anybody, and especially women when, when they're maybe they don't have a role model to look up to, and they haven't seen somebody who's like them. Like you could be the first version of whatever it is that you're aspiring to be. Mm -hmm. That was very uh, feminist advice because it was mm -hmm. equal to everyone. Right? So yeah, exactly. It's very fair. Yeah. What was the hardest part of starting a business? What was the hardest part about? Um, now that you're rolling as far as leading anyone within your organization? I think the, the hardest part for me is not gaining momentum or getting things done. Like I can get things done really, really quickly and my website will be up. I have the URL. I have all of that stuff just done immediately. It's being consistent. And I think people really underrate the importance of consistency in building a brand and building a community because I've seen people come and go who have amazing concepts and yet sometimes even our competitors in my industry with online courses for fitness professionals and it's like they've done this one th wonderful thing and they don't launch it again or they get excited about something else and they turn their attention to that I'm like you had this amazing <laughs> product if you had just stayed with it and instead yep. of focusing on bringing something else in keep doing that one thing until it's so good that you can turn it on evergreen and whatever but consistency also means being consistent with your social media and not just posting on real and then ghosting your audience for three weeks and looking at your dms and realizing you haven't gone back to people it's consistency with your email marketing it's just showing up is so important mm -hmm. um and so that's been something i've had to really double down on in terms of my own commitment to my audience is like, I'm going to show up with a podcast episode and that's going to be an email. And that's also going to be a post and that's also going to be real and trying to make sure that I'm consistent with providing value. So when I launch something new, they already trust me and they know me and they like me and yep. all of that's been established. And so it's much easier. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm mad. I'm slow with that as <laughs> far as understanding the importance of consistency, because mm -hmm. when I go back Every positive thing in my life was due to consistency. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is just the same, this podcast, you know, right. anything that we do, uh, I've noticed that. And I think it's, it's Alex and Layla Hermosi that really push like doing the boring shit yes. consistently yeah. is what makes anybody successful. Mm -hmm. That's, that's great advice. Um, 
what is there anything that you wish that people knew about what you do that you don't think they do? That's really interesting. I feel I feel like sometimes I can forget to show up as like bringing what I think is the magical ingredient of my classes and my rides is my personality and those after class conversations and the jokes on the microphone that certain people hear and they're like, that was hilarious. Like, it's like that funny in the moment stuff. And after I built my Instagram following, it's not major, but it's, you know, it's doing well. I sometimes forget, I have posts that are super valuable. I have reels that give a ton of insight and advice. And sometimes I forget to bring in that personality that in the moment behind the scenes stuff Mm -hmm. of my stories and talk about my dogs and my life. And some of that's intentional. Like I like to have some boundaries with what I share, but I, I think I, I mean, I like to in this next year, do more of that and be brave of letting people come kind of see behind the curtain, be like, I'm a real human. I make mistakes too. And, um, everything's not so perfect because I do think that that's really what increases that relatability. Mm -hmm. Um, and anytime I post a funny reel, that's joking or I'm lip syncing to something that tends to get shared a lot because other people relate to it too. So I think really just that human side of things. And then, you know, I used to be, much more open about um, and vulnerable about mental health challenges and some other things that I advocated for due to my own personal experiences. And I'd like to do more of that in the next year because I realize a lot of people are coming to my community for the first time and they don't know. I just sort of assume they know all the things that you rattled off at the beginning of this podcast. I'm like, oh, right. They didn't know I founded the Dress Collective and I've done all these other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's fi- a hard list to keep track of. List. Yeah, you're not making it easy for anyone no and i think finally just like yeah i i feel i i feel like showing up consistently um will provide those opportunities for me to do that um and bring people in a little bit deeper as i as i head towards other things i want to do i've noticed that some of your posts uh are simply you turning on the camera Mm -hmm. and and talking Mm -hmm. um some of the ones that I've seen a l- about personal development, about um, mindset, you know, some of the stuff you do mm. that that you found success in. Um, when did you start looking at at personal development? Was that ever something that was like, was it a light bulb thing, mm-hmm. or did it just come from doing the work? I feel like my perspective on personal development didn't fully shift like overtly or at least explicitly in my mind until this past year, probably. And it's funny, like, I mean, I've, I've always gone to therapy for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've always seen the value, especially in like sports psychology and and being an athlete, understanding mindset. But I think to maybe a limit where I'm like, there's a part of, the work and success that's just like doing the work and it's going to suck and you just have to get through it. And life is hard sometimes. And that's it. Like, and not really leaning into the woo of some personal development work. However, (laughs) however I was wrong. And I think for me, expansion of what's possible and expansion of understanding my own potential, like, I really did not realize how much I was limiting myself, Mm -hmm. whether that's personal relationships, whether that's understanding what abundance is out there and how that could be possible for me. Entrepreneurial wise, the potential impact I could have on people. um, I really was, I, I had, I feel like these blinders on and then somebody took them off and I was like, oh my, there is a whole other world that's possible for me. And so And that's been made possible from personal development, being more self-aware, understand, like really sitting with myself and challenging certain notions or truths that I had where I saw things very black and white and being like, maybe that's not 100% accurate. I think that comes with experience and age. And I think you'd probably agree with some of that. It's like you have experiences where things don't work out 100%. And sometimes it's easy to just sort of say, well, that's because of this person and whatever. And then a few years later, you're like, maybe, maybe things are a little bit more in the gray. And that is, 
that can be a little scary to be like the things, the truths that I had in my mind aren't, aren't, weren't that way, but they got me through this experience. So I'm glad, you know, had them. And now, now it's a season of growth Mm -hmm. and understand your own responsibility in your success, I think is something that I've, I've really understood this past year. Yeah. I think you touched on something that I think is probably one of the biggest things in my life that has shifted was I just started blaming myself for everything Mm. and taking responsibility. It's a fine line. Yeah. Right. And, and, but at the same time, if something's not our fault, we can't change it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think you're right in as far as, as that. And it sounds like asking better questions and, um, really, really getting outside of yourself is, is something that's really shifted. Mm -hmm. Um, is there something that you know of that goes against others in your industry? Like a tactic or a strategy or belief, skill set, a focus? I think, well, I mean, from the spin world, I feel like I, right now what's really popular is a lot of videos with insane choreography, insane athleticism, and that's what's trending. Okay. And I so appreciate like the athletic ability of instructors. It's pretty intense. It's pretty intense. Yeah. When you're seeing somebody go like 140 double time, like on the beat and they're like flying out of the saddle and then they're doing all these things. And you're like, it's like the Macarena up on the bike. <laughs> um, that's great. And that will get a lot of views. Yep. What I am very passionate about is the person who is stepping into that studio for the third time and they're shit scared and they have never been to a gym in their life and they have horrible self-confidence and what is like that person in the back we're we're also coaching for them right Mm -hmm. and what especially a lot of the spin instructors who are at cycle bars and different sort of they're in smaller towns like they don't they don't relate to these insane videos of crazy choreography and whatever is looks and they're like am i supposed to be doing that to be amazing could be scary right yeah Right. And sometimes dangerous, right? It turns them off. Yeah. yeah. And so bringing people in has always been a bit of a superpower of mine and seeing that person in the back and making them feel welcome. And I think that for the longevity of spin instructors, indoor cycling instructors, fitness professionals, it's having the ability to make, to coach effectively to that person while challenging the person in your front row Mm -hmm. and knowing how to do that simultaneously, offering options, um, being really aware of the energy willing to change course and not be completely committed to your routine or whatever. Like you, I've, I'll stop the music and chat with them for a second, which some people are like, what's going on? And others love it because they know some motivation is about to hit them. And sometimes it's like, like, get your shit together. Like you showed up for a reason today. Yeah. The energy's at about 80%. I know there's another 20, like we all have responsibility in this room and I can be like that a bit because it's sort of like you're leading a team and sometimes you know when they need that extra push. Yep. Um, and so I just think in terms of the the outlier of my industry, I feel like coaching motivation is far supersedes your ability to come up with creative choreography. And so something might get views, but does that convert into a second time rider? Does that second time rider then do an unlimited membership of your studio? Do they come to all of your classes? Like, who are you, who are you working for? Right. Yeah. And so when people are trying to find their footing in Instagram and social media, it's like, think about your audience. If you're a spin instructor who does not want to do a course for other spin instructors, don't create content that is for other spin instructors, create it for your audience. Yep. Um, and so I think just understanding marketing and understanding that is, is really helpful. And I don't think a lot of, of instructors and fit pros take that entrepreneurial mindset into building their own community, building their following who would, would follow them wherever they go to any other studio. Right. Who motivates the motivators? <laughs> David Goggins. Oh no, I'm kidding. I, I listen to a ton of podcasts. I listen to Glennon Doyle. I listen to Rachel Rogers. I take in books like a sponge. I am always trying to find inspiration, whether that's through a quote um, a book, what podcast, just like I said, 
And something that gets me thinking about a concept that I can that I can then communicate and motivate through a, a track or through the entire ride, mm-hmm. um, or even to my to the, my coaching clients or whatever. It's like we we have to do a lot of mindset work when we're coaching others and when we have a course or a container and you can become a little bit of both mindset coach and a, and tactical strategy and stuff. But I think for anybody like personal development work is incredibly important, especially for instructors and motivators. Like if you are somebody who's going to be communicating with a, an emotional song, in the background, <laughs> like you have to be inspired. And you're, if you're teaching seven times a week, like, like I am, I, I absolutely have to be inspired both through the music and through the message too. It's incredible. Like I, 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 <laughs> you're coming to a spin uh, class now. I can feel it. <sighs> it's very uh it it's definitely intimidating both to my mind and my lungs <clears throat> yeah I, one day uh i so goggins actually got me into marathon mm-hmm. running like I, right. I then trained for a year and a half and then and then ran a proper marathon mm-hmm. and i think that eventually like kids they ruin your life um they take all your time mm-hmm. and so i think part of my wanting to do an Ironman, that is like, mm. that got pushed yeah. quite a bit because who's got four hours to do training? It's with so, in- yeah, I have not done it, anything but like that. it's very intense. Um, I totally for, w- forgot where I was going to go with that, but. Um, I was inviting you to a spin class. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, I was trying to get away from it. Um, you have to, you said, I have to do an Ironman first before I come to a spin class. I, I, I think so because I, my i'm when i looked at the when i looked at it i was like okay i don't really like running that much mm-hmm. i can't swim worth a shit mm-hmm. and my back hurts on a bike so i'm like i don't even know why i want to do this and there's this little voice being like yeah iron man iron yeah man. you gotta do i it. feel like you'll feel amazing once you do it and like not i say this a lot in my class I'm like not everything that you need is going to feel great, right? And knowing the difference between needs and wants is where you're probably going to find success. Yep, very fair. Um, that will make people stand up when they've been sitting down, usually. Very I'll fair. I'll say things like uncomfortable or unable, and then they'll add something, a resistance to the dial. Yeah, yeah. Knowing how to like get people to dig deeper is is uh, a cool skill to have. And, mm-hmm. some, and some of that comes from these, these works, like David Goggins, who's you know, like the most intense man. I'm not even through the book yet. So I, I learned that well in, um, somebody, somebody painted that picture for me as far as what motivates, especially, uh, masculine and feminine energies. Mm. I respond very well to just people yelling at me. <laughs> Football yeah. was a big one. I, I, I think that I probably would have done very well in the military. Mm-hmm. I've just like, that's how I respond. I, yeah. I respond very well to people like, doubting me and and saying mm-hmm. you can't do this um but i i definitely noticed that that you would have to be very balanced in the way that you're you're pushing people mm-hmm. right yeah knowing when to regress mm-hmm. and and or ask for more is part of effective coaching i think both like coaching clients and then coaching in that room and so when you are pushing somebody to their limits or asking them to sort of like knock on that door of their limitation. And I'll have them racing out of the saddle for like 32 counts or something. And then we, the room goes dark and I can just see everybody's energy. Like there's a point where I might then switch that to a climb because I know that they need that moment Mm -hmm. or maybe my songs are, are crossfading really quickly and the beat drop for the next one's coming in super fast and nobody is ready for it. Well, instead of forcing everybody to continue on with this, this plan, I'll again, I'll pause and give them a breather and like ask them to refocus. Like I talk about athletes a lot and knowing when to recover is really important. I have a lot of riders who are like the most intense people who will not sit down when I tell them to sit down and recover. And I'll have to go to their bike and be like, no, <laughs> like you have to sit down because the next song is a five minute jog and right. that's going to ask you, and I don't want you to fail in that moment. This is the time. So yeah, asking for that progression or regression of effort um, and, and kind of keeping your team together is, 
is very crucial. And see, same thing with courses. Like sometimes I'll add an implementation week where they just get to implement because everybody's behind in the coursework and going on to the next week doesn't make any sense for, for anybody. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned some, so we talked about motivation, Mm -hmm. uh, and you also mentioned a mentor, uh, you're allowed to do shout outs if you Mm -hmm. want. What are the biggest, what or who are the biggest influences in your life? Whether it's been mentors, books, places, Mm -hmm. things you've seen. Yeah, I've had some amazing work mentors, Aileen White, who, uh, was the former CEO of the Humane Society. and taught me so much about, I mean, building relationships, how to leverage relationships, how to um, navigate extremely tricky situations and crisis communications has been something I've done and like anticipating risk and making a plan for that, which is very you know, big in PR. Yeah. Very. Yeah. It's like, what is the worst? What, how could this go terribly? Mm-hmm. And you think of a plan for that. Yep. Um, And so she's been amazing. Wade was an incredible mentor to me for the time I was there, which was five years. And really, like, in terms of grit and hustle and more is more and creative, like, I mean, the team is successful now, unfortunately, not on Sunday, but successful now as a result of all of that foundational work that him, Kyle Walters and Mike O'Shea put together. And I saw that building. And so it's really incredible to see all the success now happen. And then finally, my mom has always been my most um, my biggest inspiration, she passed away in 2014 due to mental illness. And that was like this break in my adulthood of having a very charmed life to then uh, dealing with everything from being the administrator on the estate to sort of reparenting myself and figuring out how do I progress from here when this was my best friend and the person I I turned was my soft place to land with everything. The person I text and call and I am so inspired to this day by the type of person she was and all the stories I heard, even, you know, anybody who loses somebody loves hearing stories about them that they hadn't heard before. Mm -hmm. And I had the police. She was, uh, she was an autopsy technician at HSC. And so she had this cool CSI job And I remember the police sent this amazing like flower arrangement and also letters from all of these different constables and people who worked in the homicide and and IDENT unit um, about these interactions they had had with her where she was so kind to them and would like, you know, it was this bright light and really sometimes awful and hard to work place. And how altruistic she was and how she ran 10 miles to and from work every day in the winter, in the summer, wherever. She was one of those people who, like, when I think about working hard, I think about her. She also had a a side thing where she had a children's clothing company. She sewed. And so I still hear her voice in my mind of, like, you can do this. Absolutely. And so my my podcast name is, is Yes, You Can. And so I still feel when I'm faced with something really hard, whether it's relationships or business or, you know, just anything, I still feel very much connected to that support from her and who she was. And I hear that voice of the, you know, yes, you can, which I now bring into my rides. And that's why I named my podcast. Yes, you can, because I I say that in those moments when people need some inspiration and motivation. Mm -hmm. Uh, What pushed you to start the podcast? Why a podcast over anything else? Well, I think it was an extension of of what I was doing in the room of of teaching. And I, I, the first episode talks about grief and it talks about my journey with losing my mom and, and all of that. And I don't think people realized <laughs> what had happened. And I really was like, I was, I'm still passionate about this, but mental health isn't something that we like we talk about more now because of one day of the year, but let's talk day. Yay. But the stigma that my mom faced this, the, the challenges I had with telling her story afterwards, I felt a lot of pressure to silence it and sort of minimize it. And, Hmm. you know, there's an illness and let's make it really vague. And I'm like, no, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. Like, this is my story too. This is her story. And if somebody who's this strong, who can run 10 miles a day and do all these things, falter and feel lo- this lost well i mean there's 
obviously more needs to be done. And part of that is telling your story. So mm -hmm. I started with that and wanted to just motivate my riders, honestly, more. And then I was just really curious and bringing in that storytelling aspect of I want to hear people's stories. I want to know what makes them tick. I through this entire time I've been wanting to ask you questions because I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like, you are not allowed. Let's talk about your shit from firefighting <laughs> to this. Like, let's talk about that, right? Yeah. And um, and so I just love being like the topics I'm curious about. It's like a, a selfish thing where I want to have conversations about it yep. and research it and impact people through that. And I also find like I listen to podcasts while I'm doing other things. I like to multitask. It's the ADHD in me. And so making something that's consumable and hearing these conversations. Um, yeah, I just I, I love doing it. Do you think that doing what you do would be any different if you live somebody or somewhere else? Because half of your business yeah. uh, online, yeah, and you can reach anyone. Yeah. And then the other half is very mm -hmm. community and, and location-based. I think that I would not, I don't think I'd be the same version of myself if I, if I lived anywhere else. Crazy. I really don't. I really don't. And okay. I think that's partly because most of my jobs I've been recruited for have come from referrals, have come from my network, my reputation you know, people knowing what Crecom is and they know about that, those, the streeters as we call them or auto failing an assignment. They, that's like, it gets you in the door as we were talking about earlier. And then, um, from progressing up in my career or having new opportunities given to me, it's because of this solid reputation. And there's like the small, big town sort of mentality that we have here. And I also think in that small town mentality, it's like anything's possible. Like you can, you can still do things that are new here that that haven't been done you can mm -hmm. make a mark you can make an impact so i i you know i'd like to believe that i would be i would have the same success that i'm proud of in another market but again it's like winnipeg is great because there's that community but it's also a test market for a lot of things because it's a tough market too yep. um it's not easy to be successful especially if you're an outsider coming in and so community i've i've loved building the community that i have and um, a lot of the partnerships I've built have been through this, like, well, why not sort of curious, let's just try it and see what works versus maybe other markets where you might be a little bit more jaded or people are a little more cynical or, you know, not quite as willing to support one another. Yeah. We have a very similar uh, view of of that in, in home building is that if mm -hmm. you can build homes in Winnipeg yeah. and in our uh, climate and, yeah. and our we have some of the worst clay in the world. It's oh horrible to deal with. So if you can build here, you can pretty much build, yeah. build anywhere. Um, so wrapping up, like I, I think one of the hard things is that one, I'm probably going to have to have you on every year <laughs> because the list just keeps growing faster and faster. So um, wrapping up, uh, you know, the phrase, you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that I should have asked you that didn't that you wanted to talk about that uh, you think would be beneficial to anyone listening? I think if I have some more motivation for people, it's just like, especially Winnipeg listeners, is that I I get maybe I get this coming from a frustration. I get frustrated when I hear people complain about Winnipeg because hmm. I'm like, yep. this is a you problem. This is not a Winnipeg problem. Yep. Like it is completely what you make it. and. If you are going to find comfort commiserating and complaining with somebody else at a water cooler, it's like, you're just not my type of person and, yep. and you're not going to attract whatever it is that you actually want. And if you're going to be honest with yourself about what it is that you truly want, it's probably not sitting in a negative space, complaining about something. I understand tough shit happens to everybody. Tough things have happened to me too. I just talked about a really tough thing coming back from that. And so the the complaining about Winnipeg thing, it's like, then go go live somewhere else. But if you're not brave enough to do it, then make the best of your situation. And if you really sit and think about the things that I just talked about that I was able to do, that I feel proud of, anybody can do these types of things. Like truly, you don't have to have the education I had or experience or whatever. I grew up in the north end of the city and on Flora Avenue and went to King Edward School in Lansdowne. And I just feel really passionate about um, challenging people to sort of look at is, am I, am I happy? Am I motivated and excited about my, like the things in my life 
or is everything fine? And am I sort of settled into monotony and routine? And just from a motivation perspective, some people might think that's like, well, that's not for me. And then they might come back around to it in a year and be like, what am I doing with my life? Am I really excited about getting up most of the time? Or am I feeling like my life is slipping away from me? And so finding your purpose and your passion, I think is sort of at the core of what I've been talking about. I've done a lot of different things because I get passionate about them. And rooted in all of that is trying to make an impact and doing some good in the world and then finding new and exciting things that light me up. And I think that that's possible for a lot of people. They just don't, they, they're just not open to that quite yet. And so if there's a challenge, it's like, get out of the Winnipeg sucks mentality and, and make the best of it or go, go find, you know, an exciting opportunity somewhere else. And maybe, maybe something else is somewhere else for you. But if you can't do it here, if you're not willing to be brave here, then changing your environment is probably not going to be the magical ingredient. Yeah. That's the tough love come from Hannah Pratt. Uh, the grass is always greener, but there is shit on both sides. Yeah. Right. Exactly. There, there, there always is. Um, okay. We have like, there is so much more to talk about. We still haven't do- dived into uh, DJing. Oh yeah. And how you got there, how you did that. Um, but I, I think that, I mean, you will not, ever stop this list and uh, i think it's phenomenal and i really appreciate you taking the time how can someone uh get in contact with you for for any of the things that they want to complain and say winnipeg does that (laughs) how do they find a partner to complain with yeah if they're still listening to this at this and they it's a winning in winnipeg podcast i hope that they don't feel that way um especially as we're about to approach winter but I, uh, so at Hannah Rose spin on Instagram, you can connect with me there. I have an email list where I send my playlists out to. So if you want some DJ curated playlists with some remixes, you can join that. It's in the link in my bio, um, Hannah Rose spin.com where there's a bunch of different resources. And if you're a wannabe fitness and uh, professional or instructor, definitely shoot me a DM. Or if you want to learn how to create a course, I, I will happily send you all the free resources. So, yeah. Amazing. A lot of fire coming from Hannah Pratt. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Dad.